أجل فرجا الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم اخرجنا من ظلمات الوهم واكرمنا بنور الفهم اللهم افتح لنا باب رحمتك وانشر علينا من خزائن علومك يا ارحم الراحمين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما My brothers and my sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته First of all thank you so much for having us I wanted to come to visit you all for a while so thank you for being so welcoming and hospitable Second of all, that was a really deep lecture, man. That was good. MashaAllah. You did that yourself? Oh. And a man didn't write that for you? No? no. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to go following what Sister Zahra has been speaking about. I think actually it's very deep and very important. And you come to question your whole worldview and your whole paradigm on why you think something is valuable. So we want to speak objectively about masculine and feminine. We don't want to speak with the notions that we have, and we don't even know where it came from. Plus, we don't even know where it came from. So the first thing I'm going to begin with is a slogan that you all know very well. لا فتى إلا علي ولا سيف إلا الفقار who can tell me what fata means? La fata illa ali. What does that sentence mean? We say it a lot when we wear the necklace, right? But what does it mean? La fata illa ali. It means usually. Huh? Ah, Ah, ahsant. So, so in the beginning, when you say fata in Arabic, usually some people right now they think it means the way it's usually used. It means young man, but actually. Fata within Islamic civilization and history was often used to describe a group of people called the Fityan. They were knights, they were warriors. So they were young warriors, not only youthful boys or men. And when you understand it in the context of this type of warrior mentality, say, La Fata illa Ali, you're alluding to a certain blueprint of what a man should be here. So we're speaking about right now, at the very beginning, what a man should be and what a woman should be. So Islam believes there's a way for a man to be and a way for a woman to be. That lecture that came preceding my lecture used the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a basis for this, that there is a certain way. There are names of majesty and beauty. There's a certain way that is encouraged for a man to be and a woman to be. And even biology, just natural biology, forget Islam, agrees with this. The way that we are attracted to each other agrees with this. It's in sync with this idea. That's why when a woman sees a man who is, you know, very to himself and his voice is very high pitch and he's, you know, his hands are like this sometimes, you know, you don't feel very attracted to that. That's not very attractive as a man. I don't want to marry a man like that. And likewise, for a man, when he's looking at a woman and she's walking around, bossing everyone around, telling him what to do, and she's the boss lady, independent, and everything, that's not always very attractive to a man. He's not, he's not very lured by that. You know, he doesn't want to marry his brother. He, he wants comfort and kindness. He wants someone sweet. There's a certain way to be. Now, these ideas have become offensive. It's become offensive to say, it's nice for a woman to be sweet. Or, it's good for a, woman to be uh, a man to be strong. It's good for a man to be strong. Yeah, a woman should be strong too. Of course she should. Of course she should. But, it's not a negative trait if a woman is not as physically strong as when you look at a man. If he can't lift up part of the couch, he feels a little bit Ashamed. He should. He should. You should be able to lift a little bit of the couch. You know, a minimum level of strength is not just recommended. It's necessary as a man. In Islam, we believe a man should be a certain way and a woman should be a certain way. And what I'm going to speak about is the certain way a man should be. And I can go on for a long time with this, but 
I've condensed it because this can be a whole course. And this is what I run my Spiritual Warrior Project on. We have the King program and the Queen program. The Queen teaches the woman how to be a woman. And the King program teaches a man how to be a man. That means sometimes we have a grown man who's 40 years old, but he lashes out and gets angry and shouts and makes a big fuss. And really what's happening here is, is just, it's an infant having a tantrum in a big hairy body. That's it. He's still a boy in his mind. He's still a little boy. He has a boy mentality. There's no man mentality. We work on something called man psychology and woman psychology. And the narrations within Islam help us, very much so, when it comes to these ways that a certain man should be, and a certain woman, uh, the way that a man should be, a certain way that he should be, and a way that a woman should be. So we have blueprints. These blueprints as to what a man should be. We call them archetypes. There are feminine ones and masculine ones. These archetypes are very important to understand and to know because the archetype will tell you what the mature form of a man woman are and it will also tell you what the immature forms are. Like I just mentioned, the man having a tantrum. Some people think that's manly to go out into the street and shout and if someone swears at you in the other car to go crazy. And, but that's not very manly actually. To be manly is to be focused, level-headed, logical, rooted, calm when you need to be, a warrior when you need to be, to put each thing in its rightful place. That's manly. Screaming and going crazy, especially when it's at your wife and your children, which a lot of these men are using their aggression on when it comes to domestic violence. That's not very manly. To have a loud voice is not very manly. The archetypes explain to you what is the mature form of what a man is and the immature form that we call shadows. Shadow forms. These shadows, each one of us here has a shadow. Every one of us. I have a shadow. Sister Zahra has a shadow. We all have shadows. That shadow is built upon the suppression of years and years of our personalities. Sometimes for good reason, and not always for good reason, it creates something inside us that rears its ugly head when we don't want to see it. It comes out. So it's important to be aware of that and to come towards understanding my mature forms as a masculine or as a feminine, as a man for my masculine and as a woman for my feminine qualities to come out in a way that I am doing it consciously and intentionally. That way I can suppress the shadow from coming up without me being conscious of it and I know my triggers, I'm aware of the triggers and I reach an equilibrium of what it means to be constantly within the positive realm and the mature realm of my masculine or feminine qualities. These archetypes are several and I can explain them through the Imams. I can explain them through movies. I can explain them through prophets because these are constant tropes. Tropes that we find constantly within popular culture. The same stories being retold again and again in every movie, in every show, in different books. They're the same stories being retold because we gravitate towards these tropes. We want to be like these tropes, and I'll, I'll explain that as we go along. So, Allah Muhammad wa Muhammad. So we have. Salaam ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So, these archetypes are based primarily on the psychology introduced by Carl Jung where he speaks about the common understanding of a subconscious that all people have and that they share. Like what I mentioned about being attracted to, the, to those qualities that we all agreed and we laughed. Not always agree, but generally 90% of the time we agree and we laugh because it's true for most of us. So based on this, he came forward with different archetypes on what it means to be a man or a woman. I'm going to be mentioning four of those archetypes, mainly rooted from the book by the same name called King, Warrior, Magician, Lover. And it's the same archetypes, those are the same archetypes that I base the Spiritual Warrior project on. Those archetypes, you can find them even inherent 
like I mentioned, within stories of the Prophets and the Imams. So when it comes to the main archetype, this is the, the prime archetype, which we call the king archetype. Every man and every woman are attracted to the king. And the man wants to be the king, the king energy. And you find that constantly within our tradition, even when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name, Al-Malik, Allah is the king of all kings. So it's very normal to be attracted to the idea of a king, of a ruler. You want to gravitate towards this energy without associating yourself as being this king. You're given the opportunity to be the king by Allah. He allows you to, as a man, to come forward and he gives you a kingdom. Even when it comes to the name of Imam Ali, Amir al-Mu'minin. Amir, prince or commander. Amir, Malik, king. Allah provides man with an opportunity to rule. Even when we say Rabb, Rabb is nourisher. In Arabic, they constantly say Rabbul Bayt, as the man is the Rabb of his home. So the man comes and is given opportunity to lead. Allah gives him that. Al Rijal Qawamun al Nisa. That man holds dominion over women. Allah gives him that over his woman and his children, that he has a kingdom. And as a king, there's a certain way that he has to be. Now there are shadow forms to this and mature forms to this. And unfortunately, in our day and age, most men fall into the shadow immature forms. The mature form of the king is to function as a blessing giver. He gives blessing. He listens. When there are problems in the kingdom, when there are problems in the kingdom, he hears out what the problems are. He tries to correct those because his second function is he brings order into the kingdom. So if you have a home and a family and you're the patriarch and you're the leader of that home, you have to make sure that there is order in the home. If there's no order in the kingdom, then there can be revolts. People come in, they steal, they break, they fight. And if someone isn't ordered within his own self, because he has to lead by example, so if he is not ordered within his own self, and he's not providing and putting everything in its rightful place with his own self, then it's going to be difficult for him to do that in the kingdom, and so there will be chaos. And so you have a lot of dysfunction in the family. It's of course not all on the man, there has to be someone helping him, there has to be assistance from his partner, the queen. She has to be there to help him, and if she's uh, one of revolution, rebellion, it's going to make that kingdom very hard to sustain. But the man must initiate. The man must be the one who initiates because he's the man. The responsibility is on him to initiate and to lead by example. And by leading, it means he is the servant of the family. It means he serves. It means he puts the family before himself. And constantly you find in the stories of the Imams, in the way in which they exemplify this leadership, Imam Ali alayhi salam, for example, he doesn't do it by moving into the shadow forms. The shadow forms, the main shadow form that we find for the king is a tyrant. A tyrant king, which is the one we find the most. The one who unleashes his wrath unjustly. The king is just. To be just, like Allah is adil, you must be adil. You must put each thing in its rightful place. And if you don't, if you start messing up with putting different things in the wrong place and you start ensuing chaos in your kingdom, you will fall into being a tyrant king. That's the one that lashes out and that's the one that squashes those people around him that slowly are coming up because they're moving into the king energy. He doesn't want them to. So this is the father, for example, the father that does not allow his son to grow. That when his son is coming up with a piece of homework or a drawing, he does not encourage him. He does not give him time. He squashes it. He doesn't show him importance. He does not value him. In fact, sometimes he feels threatened by him. And so he keeps him in his place. This happens very, very often. Sometimes it's not in the family. Sometimes it's in the workforce. Sometimes maybe there's a manager and an employee is very smart and has great ideas. And when you bring forth those ideas, that manager or CEO, he might not like it. And he might squash you and humiliate you in front of other people. He is exuding tyrant energy in that moment. That is something more prevalent right now than the mature king. A lot of the time, when we find women that are very angry at men, 
it's because they have seen so much tyrannical men in their lives. And the man, in his tyranny, has lost himself. It's the same situation I was speaking about here, how the woman has lost herself in the workforce. She's become completely masculine. The man has realized, when we say toxic masculinity, it's not that masculinity is itself to toxic. It's not toxic. It's the same when we say toxic femininity. There is something that is a shadow form within the feminine and the masculine. The tyrant king or the shadow forms, that's what we're referring to when we say toxic masculinity. But it doesn't mean that masculinity is inherently toxic. If someone was truly masculine, true masculinity and too much masculinity is great. That means it's a good thing. Masculinity can't be toxic if it's done right, if it's mature. What we're calling toxic is the shadow form that applies to both. So this is the way in which now people are inherently, they're calling masculinity inherently toxic because the tyrant has become so prevalent that people think the tyrant is masculinity when it isn't and it has never been that way. So when Imam Ali -Islam was the Khalifa and he was walking in the marketplace and he heard a woman cursing Ali ibn Abi Talib and he asked her, why do you curse him? She didn't know it was him. And notice how he's the Amir and he's the Khalifa and he's walking in the marketplace. There's no bodyguards. There's no, no big commotion. He's walking. She doesn't know who he is. She hasn't seen him. And she says, this Ali ibn Abi Talib is always going to war. And he sent my husband to war. And my husband passed away. And now I'm with these orphans. And it's all because of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He didn't tell her who he was. He asked her, can I come and visit and help you with those children? And she accepted. And for a vast amount of time, he would go and he would help this lady with her children until a day came when someone saw Imam Ali alayhi salam going to her house and leaving and tell her, how do you know the Khalifa? And she said, what do you mean? What Khalifa? And she, they said, that, that man is the Khalifa. That man's Ali ibn Abi Talib. And she had no idea. And he could easily have said, and take an offense that I've been doing all of this sacrificing and doing and everything for you, but he didn't. He heard what the people needed. He heard their pain and he had empathy for their pain. He didn't take offense. The king can't have thin skin and be offended, constantly feeling like you're hurting me and taking things personally. As a man, you can't be that. You have to constantly be level-headed to direct the family or the community, or whatever else it is that you're leading into the right place at the right time because you are a person of order and leadership and you're supposed to be trusted. And the woman in your life will only trust you and give you that respect that you so long desire when you earn that, when you become someone that is just, someone that isn't tyrannical, and that tyranny can come out in all of us at any time, which is why it's so important that we know our triggers and understand our shadows so that we can reach an equilibrium amongst all the different archetypes to constantly be in the mature form. That's what the aim is here. The aim is to be in the mature form. Always. It's not to move too far into something when we have, for example, the warrior archetype, the king, warrior, magician, lover. The warrior archetype constantly is looking to set its mark upon the world. That's how a man is supposed to be from the very beginning. And it's more inclined to be prevalent during his youth. So when you're young, remember when I was young, I want to go and travel and do everything I'm doing. That's what pushed me to go to Lebanon, for example. You're a lot braver. As you move into middle age, that calms down in you and you set more into, let's say, the king archetype as you're trying to build your dynasty and your family in the mature way. But you can't let that go too far that you become arrogant to a place where, again, you fall into that tyranny. Or you start to associate yourself with the energy as if it is you. Because you constantly have to keep moving out of it. So there's still some warrior in me, but I have to understand it's not as, it's not as prevalent as it used to be. And that's okay. There are different stages to life. There's a stage where man must sit down. And as you grow, as a patriarch of your family, and you see your sons coming up, and you see the youth coming up, those youth, you have to embrace them in our communities around the world. We don't do that enough. Alhamdulillah, I can see his community does that. But in a lot of other communities, the elders don't let go. And the youth are stumped. 
And that's part of tyrant energy, not allowing the youth to take over into going, going into the king energy to lead. They're not letting them. They're threatened by them or whatever else. They hold on to it as if it's them. As if if they let go, they die. It's not supposed to be that way. So when Imam Ali was in, in one of the battles and he struck a man down, he walked around with his chest out. And one of the companions who didn't like Imam Ali alayhi salam, he said to the Prophet, look at Ali, look how he's walking with arrogance. And the Prophet said, Inna Allah yuhib hadi al-mashiyah al-an. Allah likes this walk in this moment. This is a good thing because you're supposed to be arrogant against the arrogant ones. It's about using the qualities in the right place. Al-takabbur ala al-mutakabbir. Ibadah. You're supposed to be arrogant against the arrogant one. The bully, bully the bully. You're supposed to bully the bully. He's bullying everyone, bully him. Give him a taste of his own medicine. That's not a bad thing. You've got to teach him. That's when this person, when he's using that type of arrogance, it's not so bad. Anger is not bad objectively. Anger is bad when you use it in the wrong place. Notice how we're using the idea of order constantly, which must be set by the king energy inside a man to put each thing in its rightful place and if you do that there will be no revolutions in your kingdom or your family from your children or your wife but if you have put yourself in a position a situation where your tyranny is constantly prevalent in your life and in your relationship then she won't give that respect that you want you have to earn that respect women usually want to be loved men usually want to be respected but it's not going to come for free one has to earn that respect. The same way when it comes to the magician and the, sh and the uh, lover archetypes within man. So the magician archetype is the seeker of knowledge. This of course applies to both men and women. But what's really important within the magician archetype, the seeker of knowledge and the one who is looking uh, towards finding answers, the magician usually in our communities is a person who gives advice and knowledge and that's magician energy. So right now I'm in that energy right now. Usually our shayukh are in that energy. We're supposed to gravitate towards that. To gravitate towards that you search for a teacher and you're supposed to receive knowledge. A lot of you right now are also in that energy because you're coming to receive knowledge. So this is a type of receiving of knowledge of you coming into magician energy. But the shadow form of the magician energy is the doubts that enter to break your faith and your hearts. And a lot of the time you can see it when it comes to popular tropes. If you think of the Joker from the Batman, he just wants to destroy. He doesn't care about any money or anything that you can offer him except destruction. A lot of the world right now is built upon just telling you what's wrong, but not telling you what's right. It's very easy to break things apart, but you don't offer something that I can build myself up with. So. The doubts and subjectivity and relativity, the world that is around us right now, the world of subjectivity and relativity, it makes a man no longer know which way is straight. He doesn't know left from right. He becomes someone who's not objective, so he doesn't know where to go. And if a man doesn't know where to go, the problem here is, if you're supposed to be the leader, this is why it's more of a problem for you than it is for women. If you're supposed to lead and you don't know where to go, who's going to follow you? So you need to know where you're going. If you're going to be someone, I, I don't know what my life is about, or my, my purpose, I don't really, why are you going to get married? How are you going to marry someone if you don't know what you're doing? Why would she say yes? And it baffles me that sometimes they do say yes, and then they have problems, no wonder. If you're coming to marry her, even if you don't have money, and right now if a young man came to marry my daughter, he didn't have money, but he had a plan, and he, has, he was focused, he had a mission and ambition, Sure, let's work on this. You have dreams, you have a mission, you know where you're going. Okay, this is valuable. To know where you're going as a man is ultra important. To have a mission, to have a dream, to have ambition, to have a purpose. And if you don't know what it is, a lot of us don't know what it is at 20, 21, 22. Then, constantly what I say, when I say this, a lot of brothers tell me, but I don't know what I want to do or be or what my mission is. Say, no problem, make your purpose now, right now, your purpose has to be finding your purpose. That's how important it is. So then you become a seeker and you become someone that's going around to look and find and see what am I meant for? 
Suddenly you become someone of ambition and mission. So it's in you now and it's growing in you. You see it? That's a manly quality. It's very important for a woman to know what to do. But not as important as a man when it comes to his role for the family. Because ultimately, the man is leading his family. And if you don't, she will lead you. Because there has to be a head in the family. So if you don't, you will follow. This is important. There's important. It's important for the family to have a mission statement. What is this family for? Why are we even having children? Where are we going? What is this about? If you don't know what it's about, really think about why you want to get married or what you want your family, your family to be about. If you don't know yet, it's okay. Now invest some time into finding out. So this is the magician energy. Then you have the lover energy. And this is the great balance. Imam Ali alayhi salam in Dua Kumail, he says, Allahumma arham man silahahu al-buka. Ya Allah, have mercy on the one whose weapons are tears. There's an emotional aspect to what it means to be a man. And that is rejected in the modern age because you're supposed to be tough, so you don't, you're not in touch with that part of yourself. And what that means is not to, not to, to sit down and cry. That's not what it means. It means it's the spiritual aspect of man to be present in the moment and not reject love and not be addicted to love. Not reject love and not be addicted to love. So it's a balance in between the two. Man has to love. Imam Ali was also a poet. And he loved poetry. He was a linguist. So he was a warrior and a linguist. He would cry in the mahrab in the nighttime, and on the, in the daytime he was a lion on the battlefield. There's a balance between the two. And a man must learn how to love correctly. So, for example, this is the archetype that I have the most trouble with, personally. Because as I grew up, I worked so hard that I realized I rejected a lot of love. I don't allow myself out of thinking that it's something that I'm sacrificing. It was actually a shadow form within the lover archetype. I was not allowing myself to be present in love because there's always a mission. As you see where there's an imbalance? Even when you're trying to be good, there can be an imbalance. I have a mission. I must help the community. I must go. I remember we were once in Ottawa a few years ago. I had 60 days in Ottawa in Canada and I worked 59 of those days. 59 days of constant lessons and lectures and programs and camps and parents and youth and kids and everything else. I'd come home, I'd go to the gym, come sleep for a little bit, then get up, prepare. And I'd barely see the family. And Zahra said something to me at the end of the 60 days. She said, you know, it's very hard to be with you sometimes. And that really hit me. Because I sat and I thought, what is it that I'm really trying to propagate? And I have to be an example, not only in terms of spending time with the family, but even within myself as a man. I need to be an example of myself as a man. I need to be balanced. And I almost felt guilty to enjoy myself because there's so much that I have to do. But that's not very manly. Because the real man, you can see joy in his face at the times that he is present. He can be happy. That they call that the impotent lover. That's what I was suffering from. And I, I know my triggers now. So I know that I have to schedule my time with my friends and schedule the things that I love to do as if it was work in order to do it, to stay positive within the mature frame. Because if I don't, I get too lost in my work. I'll start traveling everywhere and do it. It becomes too much that my family becomes the sacrifice and I become the sacrifice. The other side to this is the addicted lover. The one who is a honeymoon person who can't get enough, who loves you tomorrow and then doesn't love you today and then after that loves another person, another person, keeps moving from one thing to the next thing, is always looking for something, one country to the next country. That person also will never be satisfied. The mature lover understands the balance of what it means to be in the middle ground between work and mission and family and love and joy and presence and spirituality. That this Overall, these four archetypes are the general archetypes that would complete a man in terms of what he should be. And man should aim to go forward to achieve a state of equilibrium between all four. It's going to be a daily battle to do that. 
but it constantly be, has to be on your mind and you constantly have to recognize what your triggers are and constantly have to prepare on how you can withhold issues from coming up that when you're in the deep waters, you know how to swim, you don't panic, you're level-headed and you're logical and you're weighed down, you're rooted, you understand where you are and who you are within yourself, your energy is grounded, you are grounded and you are ready to lead because your kingdom, which can consist of not only your wife and children, but extended family members like siblings and parents and other in-laws and whatever else it is, is relying on you to do that. So if man wants to be respected in the way that he wishes, he has to be willing to be responsible. In a day and age when people are not willing to be responsible, yet still complaining that they're not respected, is hypocrisy. So you will be respected. Believe me, you will be respected. It's very natural, but you must be very responsible to do that too. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين